So now for example, whenever you have to manage, you always get these things, uh, is this product or technique service secure? Simply yes, no answers are often wanted, but typically inappropriate. Just like our uh, EVMs uh, being said, oh this is secure, nobody can uh, uh, break it kind of a framework or the other. The question is that there are lot of process that is involved. There is a human process and there is a computing process that is involved. So you are, have to consider in total what is the thing that what one is asking for and so without that you can't derive what is the threat model. In fact, I, if you remember I did something about TLS and SSL kind of a framework. Unless you have a notion of a threat model, you do not know whether uh, doing the MAC encryption first and then uh, doing the integrity etc. is good or bad kind of a framework. But this gives some information that is the basic thing that what one is interested like if you say suppose you lose now you were uh, a cell phone. So technically you have lost lot of things assuming people can get and your ATM pin can be it changed and so uh, you are in a nice uh, atmosphere to chase. Uh, what it is and what happens. <clears throat> and so security of an item depends upon the context on in which it is used. Complex systems can provide a very large number of elements and interactions that are open to abuse. And then if you see uh, most of the like this we see all the time kind of a thing, no need to worry our product is 100 percent secure. So once somebody says it is 100 percent secure, it means uh, it necessarily will be untrue, right. And uh, so a security manager what one should ask for is what does the mechanism achieve? Do we need confidentiality, integrity or availability exactly of this data? Who will generate the keys and who will store and have access to the keys? Can we lose keys and with them data? For example, if you encrypt your uh, uh, disk and if you lose the key, what happens kind of a framework is a thing uh, you have to bother about. Will it interfere with other security measures like backup, auditing, scanning, etc.? And will it introduce new vulnerabilities or can it somehow be used against us? Typical example is Aadhaar. So, you know. Uh, whether many of these items or attributes can be misused by somebody at some point or the other. What if it breaks or if it is broken? So availability becomes this one. So now if one is not able to uh, get the fingerprint access uh, this one and the certificate is not uh, uh, valid, so it becomes a serious problem. <coughs> and so now here it also it has an impact as uh, uh, you say this this technology or cryptography is not just a pure science or technology kind of a thing. It also has politics, social behavior and all that kind of a thing. So in that sense, it is a very complex thing. So it also plays a role in framing uh, the acts. For example, you would have heard of the IT acts in the Indian context uh, kind of a framework. Suppose you say knowingly causing a computer to perform a function with the intent to access without authorization any program or data held on it, you can it can lead up to 6 months in prison and or fine. So doing so further uh, uh, again a more serious crime it can become 5 years etc. So no, uh, knowingly causing an unauthorized modification of the contents of any computer to impair its operation or hinder access to its programs or data can lead up to some uh, uh, fine and a prison kind of a framework. So in some sense you see that many of the things have to be done this becomes the process. And so the intent does not have to be directed against any particular computer. Uh, in other words, starting automated and self-replicating tools uh, that randomly pick where the attack is covered by the act as well. 
and uh, you can look at why it is uh, uh, done because you also have to audit to say from where it originated, who was responsible kind of a framework or the other and the DOS attacks in the form of overloading public services are not yet been covered kind of a framework and that is how many of the uh, telecom services also escape on many things or the other. So, now if you say uh, the fundamental thing for anything to be say it is secure or insecure is a security policy. So, now in some sense the first step is naturally to do a security requirement analysis. So, first thing uh, as usual is identify the assets and what the value is and identify the vulnerabilities, threats and the risk priorities and identify legal and the contractual requirements. And now you have to arrive at a, a suitable security policy which would essentially mean uh, uh, first into a high level security policy that clarifies which are or not authorized required prohibited activities, states and the information flow. What kind of information flows? are possible, what is not authorized, what is a, a prohibited activity and all these things if you list out, then you can see what are the things that need to be a framed from the policy. Security policy models are techniques for the precise and even formal definitions of such protection goals. They can describe both automatically enforced policies, for example, what you have seen the MAC configuration in an operating system a policy description language for a database management system and procedures for employees for example, separation of duties or segregation of duties. So, now the step 3 has been to arrive at a security policy document. Once you have a good understanding of what exactly security means for an organization and what needs to be protected or enforced and the high level security policy should be documented as a reference for anyone involved in implementing controls. It should clearly lay out the overall objectives, principles and the underlying threat model that are to guide the choice of mechanisms in the next step. So, now here you have selection and implementation control. One is the a process has to be established just like in the EVM who is the chief election officer, uh, does he have a public key and is there something engraved on the EBM machine and all that kind of a thing should come into the picture. Name manager who owns the overall policy, names individual managers who own individual information assets, reporting responsibilities, incentives, user training, etcetera, etcetera and then comes the uh, physical security also. This is a important aspect particularly if you consider like SCADA which are connected to many of the public infrastructures where integrity plays a vital role that is how we said VIVA plays a very vital role in the context of infrastructures. So, in the physical security you have the definition of security parameters, locating facilities to minimize traffic across uh, perimeters alarm fire doors, etcetera, etcetera kind of a framework. So, all these things become the things what could be a legitimate subject, legitimate object, legitimate subject, etcetera kind of a thing. So, this would give you what are all the things in which the system should work as what one contemplates kind of a framework or the other. Uh, this is also important because I think uh, if you should know what is the thing where the trust is, where the trust is not there. For example, in the uh, to give again a simple example of the EVM machine, uh, af after the voting is done in the station, they have some kind of a, a printed uh, uh, tape that has been uh, printed by the Nasik uh, uh, currency press that has to be done between two things what they say as what is the part wherein it is to be sealed and then signed by the representatives who are at the a station kind of a framework. So, that means that now you have made an assumption that this one has not been here then perhaps that part could have been 
done something or the other. Whereas, if you have put the step here, then it is possible whatever I made the assumption under which this cannot be misused may hold good. And so, it is just like saying that uh, a two button should not be pressed at the same time. What happens when you press uh, for two candidates at the press uh, turn, what happens kind of a framework? What is the output that it is going to deliver? So, complete process has to be trained by the persons who are going to be there and this essentially trying to uh, architect where the trust is and where the trust is not there. So, that the whole architecture becomes very clear kind of a framework. If you do not have this, then it essentially means only one person knows you may not know why or oh, this may think this is trivial. But once you are trained, then you understand even of the simple task to say why this is important kind of a, a framework or the other. And then these are all think encryption, I will not go into details. And so, to just give you another UK Data Protection Act, which is old. Anyone processing personal data must comply with the eight principles of data protection, which requires that the data must be fairly and lawfully processed. You can define that. That means whether persons consent, like when you take a photograph from a street, a Google, when it takes a car, if it takes a photo, then if somebody is taking the bath, it also is a question uh, you have invaded the privacy kind of a thing, it can vary uh, from US to Europe kind of a framework. So, these are all things that one has to keep track of if you say I am going to collect this uh, data. And processed for limited purposes which you will see little later like Yahoo says or Google says I am going to use this only for analytics not for passing on and this information, adequate, relevant, not exercise and accurate it is not kept longer than what is necessary and processed in accordance with the data subjects rights and secure. For example, if you see Facebook, many of the uh, uh, privacy, what you would have thought it would, it fails. And so, actually it becomes a problem, but uh, it is so dynamic in an operating system, it becomes extremely difficult to say a kind of a framework secure, not transferred to countries without adequate protection. So, this is where the health data will not be transferred from a European this one to India, we, even though you may get many more information about what is the a thing that has happened because this you are not bound by many of these uh, uh, rules kind of a framework are there. And so, this gives you an idea for example, if you are asked can you now frame some kind of a rule even for our EVM what you think is the best one, you should be in a position to think about to say what would be the stakeholders. Now, let me get on to the uh, uh, talk which would essentially give you the scope kind of a framework. <clears throat> so, this I think you have seen already kind of a framework and uh, there is lots of dimensions and uh, uh, the it varies you have seen in many of the presentations like side channel attacks etcetera kind of a framework and privacy dimensions and we will talk and we will take a brief look on science of security and what it means for a doctrine in a cyber security kind of a, a framework. This we have seen. So, see this again side channel attack, I do not have to go in detail because many a persons you have already seen. So, now you see that side channel is any attack on a crypt system requiring information emitted as a byproduct of the physical implementation. And uh, so, which essentially means you can do a white box script analysis, nothing is hidden. You have a debugger, you can have a static analysis, uh, memory dumps, etcetera, as opposed to treating it as a black box, you can do each and everything or the other. And then you have various things, hardware is involved, you have a a uh, feed a text, encrypt it, pass it to this chip and then becomes the cipher text etcetera. And now here if you see when you are encrypting, for example, a Vernam uh, encryption by just using an exclusive R k naught plus p naught, 
you also say how much time is taken, power is taken, wh what is the noise it produces when you hit that uh, a keyboard, what is the a sound you get it, can I get something like what you could have typed by hearing the sound and then what is the time it takes to encrypt kind of a framework. Similarly, power, what is the amount of power uh, that is dissipated and similarly the heat and the electromagnetic radiation kind of a framework. That is how I think many of these uh, uh, notebooks now also I think uh, uh, you sell some kind of a tape on which you can cover so that if you person uh, stands to you next uh, with a little angle, he will not be able to see what is there on the uh, notebook kind of a framework or the other. This is marketed by 3M, very many people use it kind of a framework or the other. And the interesting thing is this side channel attack uh, essentially uh, this is like passing from the uh, this one. So, this was side channel attack came from a person who was a biology student from Stanford. So, is Paul Kosher <coughs> and worked with Martin Hellman, one of the Turing Award winners and then worked with RSA and uh, now he is also a very established person in the US National Academy of Engineering fellow or a member. And so, this only shows the way you are going to be looking at uh, various aspects of this kind of a framework. And now, scope is unlimited. For example, you can say electromagnetic signals containing full secrets and whether I can inject a fault and then hardware attacks that is you can open the box and then you have the power analysis and then you have the timing analysis. And now, if you look uh, at the how do you get the power analysis. See now here if you look at this for example, uh, if you know this structure, what is the power that would be required for squaring x into x x square and then just multiplying x into y. What is the power that is differentiated because when you are computing x to the power of uh, some i, you can also do its squares and then do the multiplication at the last. So, the squaring requires less power and then multiplication takes more power. So, now by observing this kind of a framework, now you can observe what is the thing that would have happened and now if you observe, you also get what could be the uh, password that what one had used. So, that means that by this kind of observations, that means that you also know the structure of the algorithm. If the algorithm changes, it also becomes a, a difficult aspect to worry about that kind of a, a framework as well. And similar thing you can say uh, about the uh, a timing analysis uh, as well kind of a framework. So, now here that is how you see that uh, it has a, a becomes a very difficult thing to say that under what conditions you can say something is 100 percent secure. So, it is a a challenge that comes into the uh, pictures and so you have amount. So, even simple things like uh, one of the things was a science of guessing password. Just like even in the context of let us say a 4 pin bank or a, a 6 pin uh, bank and so uh, Joseph Bono he did a PhD thesis with Ross Anderson whose book you are using a very established person and he got uh, in 2012 the NSA award for the best scientific cyber security paper when he analyzed based on many experimental uh, things or the other. For example, if you see the uh, guessing the password. So, now he essentially even on a simple thing I am not going into the detail kind of a thing what was the history of the pins. And now, you know that you always made it uh, uh, more difficult and then so it people uh, user interface also to be kept and uh, particularly after stealing a wallet. So, if you have a wallet, if it has a pin, then you see that like just like even your cell phone, once you know the pin, then lot of things uh, come out without problem. So, now he blacklisted on some probabilistic background to say how 
uh, you should avoid many of such pins or the other uh, uh, kind of a framework and then the argued kind of a framework where all this comes into the uh, picture. So, guess a human chosen secrets a kind of a, a framework or the other. So, now as you see that the security goes from a very low level by just considering what is the thing that you need for this point, how long this should remain a secret. And I, rather than I just going on using a 2048 pin many a times kind of a framework or the other. And so now let us say tracking and the Skype locations. And so it is on a real time uh, communication. So the data gram flows between two converging partners, exposes the IP addresses of all the participants to one another. If A know uh, B's voice over IP ID, she can establish a call with Bob and obtain his current address by simply sniffing data grams arriving at her computer. And using geolocalization services one can map B's IP address to the location and then the ISP. And if B is mobile, she can call him over a week or a month and observe. Once A knows B's IP, she can crawl P to P file sharing system to see if that P is uploading or downloading files and voice over IP can potentially collect targeted users uh, location. And this is also a serious infringement of privacy and for various other reasons this becomes a, a thing. So now here let us look at the Stuxnet before that. Just uh, let us look at a uh, 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 SCADA which is a uh, uh, shorthand or a abbreviation for the supervisory control and data acquisition which is essentially a control system SCADA. It is at a higher risk to computer attacks because their vulnerabilities are increasingly becoming exposed and available to an ever growing set of motivated and highly skilled attacks. Miscreants tailor their attacks with the aim of damaging the physical systems under control. And so note that the control systems earlier, again if you go back to the way your security analysis, this had a lot of physical security involved earlier and then it had its own process and then this control systems as you will see later, unlike the computing system they are not amenable for frequent patches. And so now if you say this Stuxnet is a Windows computer worm discovered in July 2010 that targets industrial software and equipment. It is the first discovered malware that spies on the subverts industrial systems. And uh, in fact even in India we had lot of uh, this one from uh, uh, Siemens, most of this data these are all. Uh, proprietary and that is how it is very difficult to do anything without their permission. So, it was naturally uh, suffered, there were attacks worldwide and maybe uh, we can claim that the effect was not as much as what uh, it affected some other countries. Kaspersky lab uh, concluded that the sophisticated attack could only have been conducted with a nation state support. That means that in some sense these are all things that could not be done by a simple university hackers like you. So, it should have some support how to steal some certificates, how to send uh, something, how to cross something or the other this should have been the a support to say that how uh, things can be done kind of a framework. Stuxnet attacked Windows systems using an unprecedented 4 zero day attacks. That means they found out there were uh, in the SCADA there were four things for which you did not know what one should be doing and the CP link vulnerability and a vulnerability used by the conflicker worm earlier. So, it is a astonishing complexity of the program and the quantity of the zero day exploits used in this work. Uh, as I mentioned zero day exploits are those that have no work around or patch at the time of their uh, construction or uh, introduction. Another unique aspect of this Stuxnet is that it contained components that were digitally signed with the stolen certificates. I think in the last class you saw how 
uh, Vishwas also showed you how one can get it signed by your own certificate, etc., etc., kind of a framework. A root kit was found for the programmable logic controller which allows the manipulation of sensitive equipment. PLC, while it is not complex, the number of input and output is fairly large, nearly of the order of thousands. And then it, uh, the conclusion from the Kaspersky was, it could have been created by a team as much as 30 individuals. In a sense, the 30 individuals in the uh, outside of the Western parlance, it means it is a huge money that is involved kind of a framework. And so that is how you also conclude that it must have been done by a state support and indicates a level of organization and funding that probably has not been seen before. And uh, uh, what was it designed for? While there is no direct evidence, the code suggests that Stuxnet looks for a setup that is used to, uh, used in processing facilities that handle uranium used in nuclear devices. And thus the ultimate goal is to sabotage that facility by reprogramming uh, the, uh, uh, the controllers to operate. So now the question is that what should be the strategy to deal with these kinds of attacks? Should it go along the lines of the IT security? How about defense in depth, analogous to anomaly detection? Can you give an example where you find defense in depth obvious in the Indian context? No one or nobody knows what is defense in depth. Simple example is a airport security. You go on checking right from the entry with so many levels. So, under the assumption at some point if something is not there, you would have been caught. So, what about false alarms in the anomaly detection? So, this is one of a serious problem. If uh, you go on getting the false alarm so often, you will not even care to take action. Should the focus be on the physical systems? rather than the software or the network models. So, these are the questions, are the SCADA systems should be treated as just IT security, just like is there any difference between an embedded system and a normal system? Somebody? A general computing system and an embedded system on time. I suppose it is for a very slow person. See, just in time, slow and fast is are all uh, just like a just in time compilation or a just in time like the uh, Japanese uh, use in their methodology. See, embedded system has been That is one aspect that is a real time system, but uh, you know many a times uh, it may not be completely essential. For example, in your own cell phone, it is also an example of a embedded system. What all you mean by an embedded system is, embedded system is one that has been designed for some particular function rather than a general computing paradigm. So, which means that for the purpose for which it has been designed, if it serves, that is good enough. It does not have to do anything else. It may involve time and many other parameters or the other. So, the uh, rate monotonic and all those things you can analyze from a real time perspective or the other. What it means is that embedded system is for a required computing paradigm rather than trying to say general computing paradigm because you will always find lots of counter example to say yeah it does this like your own translation does it translate any uh, like if you supply a complex sentence to a google translator the a translation may look awful 
but uh, that is not the one right the persons who use for general uh, conversation for whatever it is if you supply it may give a reasonable solution so it is for them specific task that what one is uh, doing it kind of a framework so in that sense here the question is that so now in the embedded system now do you have to say it is with respect to this function i have to provide the security rather than try to say that okay it has the uh, intrusion detection system it has the firewall and i tighten it on all the points where in the information flow happens and so now like if you look at what I mentioned earlier the control system characteristics SCADA which is a essentially a distributed control system. They are not suitable for patching and frequent updates. In fact, in the early times when the whole telecom system was running under a huge operating system moving from one to another was a huge task. Nowadays it has become a different thing or the other. While current tools from information security can give necessary mechanisms for securing control system, these alone are not sufficient for defense in depth of control systems. When attackers bypass even basic defenses, they may succeed in damaging the physical world. This is where you should know what are the trust and how many people can uh, affect. So now if you look at a summary. Uh, one is a risk assessment. While studies exist on cyber security of SCADA, there are very few studies to identify attack strategy of an adversary once it gains access. Existing studies pertain to data injection for power grids, electricity markets, etc. And so which essentially means in the Indian context, risk assessment is possible provided you have a very good data. If you do not have a data, it also becomes very difficult to assess what is the risk that is involved. So that means that you need to understand the threat model to design appropriate defenses and take measure to secure the most critical sensors and the actuators. So this is where you have to identify which is the points which has to be strengthened to the maximum extent. So now here the one of the main things that comes into the picture is there is a new attack detection pattern. So what does that mean technically is uh, in some sense because SCADA is a technically a, a distributed control system and now like what you uh, I think yesterday or uh, in the last Monday we took to say that if you do not check whether the input satisfies certain characteristics for which this function has been designed you may get many things or the other. Now, when it is completely distributed, each control system would have been designed assuming the domain of the input. And now here when you are assembling a large distributed control system, whether the vector that is supplied is as per each of the inputs is a question that one has to bother about, which means it has depends upon the domain of the control system for which this has been designed, the sensors and actuators. And so the challenge is to arrive at attack resilient algorithms and architectures so that they can uh, withstand the cyber assault and reconfigure and adapt control systems when under uh, attack. It is almost like a, 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 a what is that called a stable algorithms what you have studied even if it enters a fall there is a transition after some time it uh, gets into the regular cycle kind of a, a framework or the other. And so to give a very simple example, so now here you say that here the big data or the data uh, intensive approach also becomes a very useful thing. You have plant and you have sensors and this is a controller and you have the chain detection. So now the question is that if you are, a, if you have observed the behavior of the plant for quite some time and you have the data, then you have, you can see that how far the deviation is happening. And with reference to keeping the deviations, you can see whether it is uh, moving into a danger zone or a not a danger zone kind of a framework, which means that you should have enough data on which it works on varieties of uh, things or the other. So now here privacy, as we mentioned, it has a lot of uh, uh, things which is extremely 
a very complex domain. For example, you say in uh, privacy, what you want it should be undetectable and at the same time it has to be interactive like uh, you give a cash to a, uh, a counter to a merchant and it should be an active client and you should also show your credentials uh, kind of a framework like if you are going to buy and something requires 18 years and so you have to show your credentials and unlinkability you cannot identify this man purchased this and who purchased the same thing or the other. So, you need unlinkability and of course, confidentiality uh, that means this information cannot go out to many other others. So, the TAR anonymity network is one such thing is a free software and an open network that helps you defend against uh, a traffic analysis and a forum of network surveillance that threatens personal freedom and privacy and confidential business activities and relationships and state security. And so now the question is that why do you need uh, anonymity? The TAR protects you by bouncing uh, communications around a distributed network of relays run by volunteers all around the world. It, these are all managed by the volunteers. It prevents somebody watching your internet connection from learning what sites you visit. It prevents the sites you visit from learning your physical allocation. Naturally, this could be used by both for good and bad kind of a framework or the other. And so, the question is that how anonymous are you? You are only as anonymous as the data you send. And so, as uh, somebody I think you presented that uh, if uh, people have collected so much profile, they can be sure that where you are and they can get you all the information what uh, uh, Amit did uh, in the last uh, let us say two days, <coughs> how much research she has done, etcetera kind of a thing you can find it out. So, you have untrusted exit points is the exit point for traffic looking at the data. Traffic may be encrypted inside the network, but not once it is outbound. And so, now here this is another aspect what you see I, I mentioned it a purpose in privacy policies. For example, if you look at the Yahoo's practice is not to use the content of messages for marketing purposes. By providing your personal information, you give for example, in the US context, the Social Security Administration consent to use the information only for the purpose for which it was collected. How do you formalize and enforce purpose restrictions is one of the uh, challenge that comes into the picture. So, like Yahoo's practice is not to use the content of messages for marketing purposes, which means it is not for that is a negative thing. You say that it is not used for this purpose. So, if you now do a provenance, you should be able to say it was not Yahoo, somebody else leaked it kind of a framework. So, only for by providing your personal information, uh, you give consent to use the information only for the purpose that means it is only for. So, these are two things which are normally uh, used by these uh, social networks uh, kind of a framework. So, now the challenge in the context is give a proper semantics for not for and then only for and then you can realize whether this is indeed the case for example, if you say Facebook or whatever that one is kind of a framework and provide automated enforcement of purpose restrictions for that uh, semantics. So, to give you a simple example, you say that there is an x-ray technician and he sends the medical record to a specialist for diagnosis. Specialist will only reach a diagnosis if the technician first adds the x-ray to the patient, patient's medical record. Hospital is governed by a privacy policy medical records will be used only for the purpose of reaching a diagnosis. Goal, what actions can the technicians perform while obeying the restriction of purpose in the privacy policy? For realizing it, we need a semantics for purpose restrictions that tells us how to determine whether an action is for a purpose. So, as I mentioned, the x-ray is taken and the record is sent, uh, the uh, no diagnosis by specialist 
and then here add an x-ray, x-ray is added the medical record, send the record, medical record is used only for diagnosis, this is diagnosis by a specialist. So, this part it is not, so now this one she cannot misuse this for anyone else kind of a framework or the other, you have to find apart from her is there any computing process that leaked out. Otherwise, if no process has leaked out, which means the person who read it must be the person who has been able to, uh, who has revealed it and then you have to see how to see whether she indeed did it or it was due to some other mistake or the other kind of a framework or the other. So, now the question is that maybe if I give you an example, for example, in a, in the exam of a nature, you should be able to say how if I do it as a security model, say either a MAC or a, a RBAC or a, a RWFM, how you would be able to say that this property is indeed being satisfied kind of a, a framework or the other. So, now if you audit, what is the thing that happens? You build an auditor, that means the security model. So, now you say that this is the purpose restriction and you have the auditee's behavior and then you have the environment model, then you have to say whether it is obeyed. I cannot define anything, I do not know uh, whether it is uh, true or not and then you say it is violated. So, in this case in conclusive you do not know what you should do, but if obeyed means then you are sure and then here you are again sure that has happened. Again coming to the uh, voting, a broad uh, properties what you can see is, is a very hard problem. So, voting or registration, each eligible voter votes at most once. So, this is a voting process, not for the EVM. EVM is a special thing used for some counting of something or the other. So, now voter privacy, no one can tell how any voter voted, even if voter wants it, no receipt for the voter. Integrity, votes cannot be changed, added or deleted, tally is accurate. Availability, voting system is available for use when needed, ease of use naturally, accessibility for voters with disabilities, etc., assurance, verifiable integrity. That means that there is no additional vote that has come apart from those who have voted. So, now if you say what is a voter system verification, you need to uh, think about end to end integrity, voter verifiable cast as intended and votes verifiably collected as cast, as cast. Whatever if she has voted for a candidate X, it must be the case it has been uh, uh, properly captured kind of a framework. The classical readers, writers uh, program in concurrent programs like if I say this is exactly the data that I have sent it that one has collected the consumer has been able to do that, not some other data what one has done and then votes verifiable uh, that means it is counted as collected kind of a frame. So, now here I want to just state a theorem which gives you the problem which is called the cap, th uh, cap theorem. Cap is consistency, the same data is seen by all the nodes at the same time. This is one of the theorems for the distributed systems, availability, a guarantee that every request receives a response about whether it was successful or failed and partition tolerance, the system continues to operate despite arbitrary message loss or failure are part of the system. And the cap theorem is a distributed system cannot satisfy all three of these guarantees at the same time. Only uh, two of them at most can be satisfied kind of a framework which invariably means there is something you will always be left out kind of a framework. So, now in summary, what are the factors that are involved in the security? You have the attacks, which are essentially the threat models, you have the policies, what changes are permitted, this corresponds to defenses, who can know or learn what, confidentiality and you have the integrity and availability when you render the uh, service and then you have these attacks, defenses and policies. Now, the question is that what happens if you have a policy and this attack, what is the defense that you need? And suppose you have these attacks and these are the defenses and then what is the policy you should assume 
so that it can be translated into some human uh, to uh, handle those things which cannot be done automatically or by computing kind of a framework or the other. So, which essentially means that you have a uh, defense against a legacy code does not always defend which is the attack and obfuscation versus type checking what you say is that and then the integrity and confidentiality you have many of these security models leakage plus suppression becomes what and then you have many of those kind of a framework or the other. So, now having said this and now you can see whether uh, is there any foundations of science of security that is OSOS. So, yes, so, what is the thing if a person has to work on uh, security, what are the things that one should be looking at the kind of a framework or the other. So, now you must have heard there is something like formal methods because in the department also you have a CFDVS. So, at least on the name you would have heard there is a formal methods. So, which means in some sense Edgar Dijkstra what he said testing can only prove the presence of an error and not its absence. That means that you can give an a counter example. And then Tony Hoare said, but it tests the program. So, if you test it and then the result will allow it. So, formal methods make security more precise making and checking formal models is a challenge. Formal methods lack a process for aligning that means theories with reality because in security as we see there is lot of reality you have to assume there is a process and who are the persons and what is the trust and all that kind of a framework and what we need is a measurable validation and an experimental method. And so, now if you look in science, in the science you have the nature, you have the methods and you have the laws. You have the process of aligning theories with reality. So, you define a theory and say that this is the reality that is possible. Tomorrow one is able to refine the theory and move forward to say I can explain this reality in much better fashion or include what was not possible. So, in the need of science of security, persistent loss of security, what are the things that continues or is it methods to improve theories rather than rather as in science. So, now what does that mean? So, you say it is a relationship among interfaces and actions that is the reality, you have the models, you have the roles of trust that means cannot be created, but only relocated. For example, if you take the same voting machine from one point to another point, basis for composing defenses and trust relocation. What are the last predict qualitative or quantitative properties, analyze or synthesize, classes, defenses, mechanisms and policies and independence of components, which is one of the uh, things what we always uh, be when you say there are two independent virus scanners. So, it must be the case if both of them have not caught there is very less probability that this could be a virus kind of a framework. So, modeling security the question is threat models you have to bother about defenses versus threats. There are also game theoretic approaches. So, these are all things what people use develop principles for compositional security schemes particularly for big data etcetera and you have security in, uh, measurements like evaluating the strength of defense mechanisms and what is the risk management etcetera. So, now if you look from a science from one from science and another from engineering in the science with a focus on process what is the thing that you do in science? You have hypothesis, experiments and validation that is the structure. And the results abstractions, models obtained by invention and measurement plus insight, connections plus relationship which are packaged as theorems and not artifacts. Now, if you look from the engineering which has lot of artifacts discovers missing or invalid assumptions, proof of concept measurement discovers what are the real problems for example, it de detects an attack. 
So, now address questions that transcend systems and attacks, defenses, is code safety universal for enforcement? Can sufficiently introspective defenses always be subverted? Is it possible in spite of the fact you have various defenses, is it possible they can be overcome or subverted? So, which essentially means computer science is not equal to science based for security, analogy with the medical science versus medical practice. So, now here as you saw in the science, you have the theory and you have the empirical testing, you get a counter evidence, you have an inductive inference and refine the theory and goes back. Science ne uh, never settles on a theory, it loops through counter evidence forever. Similarly, in security, you have security, you have a test, you find an attack and you design to find the security. So, security never settles on a claim, every security claim has a life. So, no defense is perfect and every thief can be caught. So, now let us look at the last point wherein uh, uh, the doctrines whether uh, one should punish uh, cyber ha hackers or something or something else. Uh, success, uh, the succession of doctrines advocated in the past for enhancing cyber security. There are many aspects, one is prevention, another is risk management and then is deterrence through accountability. So, none has proved effective, can we learn from failures is the question. How about proposal of viewing cyber security as a public good? That means that if you know how to secure all your devices. It is good because if everyone does that, then everyone is safe and you are contributing to the society. How about adopt mechanisms inspired by those used for public health? Public health depends upon this. If you are clean, the environment is clean, it gives some kind of a health in general and then the billion dollars that what you have to spend also gets reduced. So, uh, like if you look at uh, cyber security doctrines looking from a prevention, you have computing systems and human elements and establishing correctness of large system is still not viable. Can we guarantee absence of vulnerabilities and hence impossibilities of attacks? Assumptions about environment varies, attacks evolve with the defenses and threats exploit new opportunities that arise due to new value creation of systems and system considered secure today may not be secure tomorrow. So, in some sense in the prevention it has not been very successful because of the complexity. And then on the risk management naturally 100 percent cyber security is not affordable. However, it is also not needed for most systems. Now, concentrate on vulnerabilities sufficiently likely by the perceived threats, which most of these companies including Symantec, IBM, uh, all these things they publish. What are all the threats in this past quarter or past year upon which they will say how much they could invest kind of a framework, could lead to expensive compromises. Quite practical, but lack of information in calculating risk is a serious limitation. Metric shall provide a good trade off between investment and cyber security. So, deterrence through accountability, attacks are treated as crimes, ok. So, this is a deterrence through accountability. Concerned with infrastructure to perform forensics, identity perpetrators and deal or prosecute them. The doctrine is punity. This may not lead to systems being kept and run. So, actions by machines and humans, agreement about illegality is elusive or deceptive and you have to have cross border cooperation. So, now you can see can we have some kind of a new doctrine on a public cyber security, which means that it is non, non rivalrous, 
because one user benefiting from the security of a network system does not diminish the ability of any other user to benefit from the security of the system. Non-excludable users of a secure system cannot be easily excluded from benefits uh, the security brings. Cannot apply the usual common goods for managing the depletion and inequitable consumption by first comers or more sophisticated users. And this is anyway not applicable to the cyber security. Now the question is that is it possible we can uh, learn from the public health and then see how the public cyber security could be done like realizing security or managing insecurity. See in the public health you have prevention, containment, mitigation and recovery. So non-compensation of victims, no punishment except like warranty. If you come then you are put because it is for the good kind of a framework or the other. And so which essentially means that all these doctrines if you arrive at it and you can see how each one would behave in some way or the other like uh, we can learning the lessons from the a public good. So with this I think the uh, syllabus for the uh, course is done. Uh, before I throw it open let me thank the uh, persons. I am happy at least 30 persons are around here and uh, uh, thanks for your patient hearing. Hopefully I have conveyed something which would be of use to you uh, uh, both either from an academic perspective or when you go back in life kind of a framework. And I am thankful to the TAs who have supported uh, very nicely and hopefully you also had a good feeling about the TAs. And then the uh, CDIP, I should uh, thank them because in spite of the limitations of the CDIP infrastructure, they have kept it running and they have promised, I have not seen my video uh, to look at how I look when I am speaking kind of a framework. I guess this also would have been useful to you and at some point all these can be used to refine whatever it is kind of a framework. With that let me say thank you and now if you have any questions because still the course is not officially complete, it is only the last day of the class. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask me now or whenever I am in the office or you can send me by email. Thank you.